Okay, this video is going to look at physical preparation, which is uh, the first dot point for what role do preventative actions play in enhancing the well-being of the athlete. The syllabus for physical preparation uh, it requires you to have a look at pre-screening, skill and technique, physical fitness, warm-up, stretching and cool-down. And then what you need to be able to do with that is you need to analyse different sports in order to determine priority preventative strategies, so which kind of strategy uh, works best for particular sports and how adequate preparation in so either adequate use of those strategies or adequate physical preparation as listed down the left hand side there uh, helps to actually prevent injury. So the first thing is pre-screening. Pre-screening occurs in three stages um, but only the first stage is mandatory uh, so if you go to a gym and you want to do um, a new workout you want to start a exercise program one of the first things that they would do with you is get you to answer seven questions and do a pre-screening with you to make sure that you are uh, healthy and able to engage in uh, that exercise program. Uh, the purpose of this is to make sure that they, number one, identify people who have major health concerns, send them to a GP to get checked, make sure that they're okay, uh, get any um, guidance from their GP or a specialist or something about what exercise can or they cannot do, uh, so that when they actually design their exercise program, it's catered to the specific person and then helps to avoid uh, serious issues that may come up. So stage one, seven questions. If you answer no to any of those questions, you're going to be sent to a GP to be cleared. And generally that's looking for heart disease uh, issues uh, where you might have a heart attack, you've had a heart attack previously, uh, you're suffering angina, all those types of things. We're identifying that person in stage one. Stage two uh, is there to identify those with risk factors, so people who might be overweight or have uh, hypertension and stuff, and that then helps them to um, amend the program and make sure it's targeted uh, to be helpful for people who have, might have those risk factors. That's stage two, which is just another bunch of um, questions. And then stage three, which is a bunch of pre-exercise measurements uh, for cardiovascular disease and metabolic conditions. Uh, but also it will just be general measurements that will help them to uh, measure your progress as you uh, improve either your fitness or your health outcomes that you want to achieve through your exercise. The next thing that's really important for an athlete is that they have really good skill and technique. So uh, the stages of skill acquisition really impact uh, the person in terms of their risk of injury. So someone who is cognitive and is still thinking about the execution of their skill and has to really focus on their skill uh, is more likely to have injury. So uh, you know, if there's a soccer player who's really has to think about dribbling, has to think about passing the ball, they may be looking down at that ball the whole time, uh, having some pretty jerky movements and moving quite slowly. Uh, and they might, you know, they might run into people, they might trip on the ball, uh, all kinds of stuff uh, can happen to them because their skill level is not very high. Uh, and so it's particularly important that someone who has lower skill levels plays with other people who have lower skill levels. Uh, it helps to reduce the risk of injury. And then the same for the other end, the autonomous end. Uh, the person who really is good at the skill can do it um, and consider other aspects of the game while doing those skills. Uh, that kind of person needs to be playing against other people who have that level of skill too because otherwise they are actually going to cause a uh, higher risk of injury to others. Uh, and so it's important that uh, for skill, people are playing against people of similar skill uh, and that we uh, make sure we cater for their level. So as they move through the stages of skill acquisition, the poor skilled person, the person at the cognitive end, is more likely to have an injury than the person at the higher end, the autonomous end of that scale. In terms of technique, uh, it's very important for any sport, but particularly sports that are very high in technique, uh, that the correct technique is taught at the very beginning uh, and that bad habits aren't allowed to keep going. So that uh, a really good example of this is tennis. So tennis has a lot of technique in it, particularly for the serve. Uh, and so if you have an athlete who is never taught how to do a serve and just really wants to play tennis and practices over and over and over again uh, to improve their serve, they're actually quite likely to cause themselves uh, an injury, an overuse injury, um, or even just a general injury because of poor technique. Uh, whereas if they, you compare that to an athlete who has been taught how to serve properly, uh, who has had a coach sit there and give them feedback and guide them and their technique is correct, they're then less likely 
to get those overuse injuries and less likely to just cause a general injury because of their serve. Uh, so correct technique, and that, that applies to pretty much every sport, good technique will reduce the rates of injury. General physical fitness. Now most often when people think of physical fitness, they think cardiovascular fitness. But remember, when you think of physical fitness, you have to think of all the health and the skill-related components of fitness. So that's cardiorespiratory fitness, that's muscular endurance fitness, that's muscular strength fitness, uh, that is agility fitness, power fitness, all of those things coming together uh, within physical fitness. And so it's very important that the person is physically fit for their specific sport. So when we have a think of gymnastics, for example, an athlete who performs gymnastics, they need to have good muscular endurance, really good muscular strength. They need to be flexible, uh, really well coordinated and stuff. And so they become the key things for their physical fitness levels. They don't necessarily require really high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness because they're not going to be out there doing movements for half an hour. Um, they're going to be doing movements for three to five minutes, uh, depending on their performances. And so uh, they need to make sure they are physically fit for their sport. If I compare that to someone who plays uh, football or soccer, uh, that's a 19 minute long sport. The person must have good cardiorespiratory fitness for that. Uh, they also need to have good uh, muscular endurance for that because they're going to have repeated movements over and over again. Uh, they need to have really good agility, really good um, power and speed because they're going to kick the ball. They need to do short, sharp sprints and change direction and dodge defenders. And so they require different types of um, physical fitness, different components of physical fitness for their sport. And so when you think of physical fitness, don't just think cardiorespiratory fitness. You need to think of both the health and the skill-related components of fitness and, how, and then think of the specific ones for the sport of your athlete. When it comes to a warm-up, the purpose of the warm-up is essentially to get the blood flowing to the muscles that need it, so that they're already nice and warm, uh, the aerobic energy system has been kicked into gear, uh, and the athlete is now able to really produce ATP quite quickly, um, the blood flow is there to remove the carbon dioxide that's, de that's uh, made, and to remove any lactic acid that might be made, to get that body ready for the performance. And so the way that we do that is that we start with general whole body movements. You want your athlete to be going for a light jog or something that requires their whole body to move as they're doing their movements. Uh, you're going to progress from that, uh, from a light intensity all the way up to a high intensity depending on the sport. Uh, and you want to make sure your movements can become more and more sport specific. Uh, so if we think of rugby union, for example, you might start with a nice light walk uh, jog, which will then progress into being sprinting and all kinds of stuff. But you also want to start to think, okay, what are we doing in rugby union? We're going to have scrums, we're going to have tackling, we're going to have athletes trying to bump others off, we're going to have them making passes while they're sprinting, we're going to have them doing big kicks uh, as well and jumping and catching. So you want to make sure that in your warm-up you progress from your light jog all the way through to you know really fast sprints where they're passing the ball, catching the ball, bumping people off and tackling. Uh, you want to really engage their whole body so they're ready for that specific sport. In terms of stretching, uh, flexibility uh, besides being a component of fitness is generally really good for any athlete to have uh, for their sport. So you want to make sure that they, uh, you know, if it's a soccer player that they can have good flexibility, particularly in their hips and their knees, so that they can swing through as they kick a ball. Uh, if it's a rugby player, you might want to make sure they've got really good flexibility in their shoulders and trunk, as well as their legs, because they're going to need to tackle and they're going to twist and turn while they're doing that. Uh, and so it's good for an athlete to be generally flexible. And so stretching should exist as part of a flexibility program uh, where you're doing you know, stretching as kind of you know, three days a week or four days a week or whatever you want to do uh, in order to improve the athlete's flexibility. But when it comes to warm-ups and cool-downs, uh, stretching has been very highly debated in terms of whether or not it actually provides much benefit for the athlete. So uh, what's come out of that debate essentially is that uh, your warm-up and your stretching, uh, your stretching should be specific for your sport in your warm-up. So what that means is uh, for most sports, that's going to be dynamic. So your soccers, your rugby leagues, your AFLs, your netballs, uh, most 
athletes now are, have taken on a more of a dynamic approach to stretching um, because it still allows benefits for performance and makes sure that their body is ready for performance. And dynamic stretching is essentially just constant moving through that stretch, which is what they're going to do when they're actually performing. Uh, but then if it might be a different sport, if you think of something like gymnastics, for example, you actually have to stretch and then hold that stretch in a particular pose. Uh, and the same thing for dance, you might have to stretch and hold something in a pose, in which case uh, static stretching may actually become beneficial because you need to be able to stretch and hold it there. Uh, PNF stretching may also be beneficial, uh, but that's you have to think about them in terms of being specific for the sport because if you do static stretching or PNF stretching and you're a 100 meter runner, you're actually going to decrease your performance because static stretching has actually been shown to decrease the power of the muscles, to decrease your speed and your strength of those muscles. And so your performance is going to be worse because you've done static stretching. And so instead, a 100-meter runner is going to do some ballistic stretching uh, before they run. Uh, but even that is only going to occur in elite athletes because ballistic stretching can be quite dangerous. Uh, in terms of using it in your cool-down, uh, athletes will use a range of dynamic and static stretching in their cool-down, and that's perfectly fine uh, because you're not then going to affect performance. Performance is over. Um, but generally still people will avoid ballistic stretching in their cooldown because it generally does not help all that much. During the cooldown, uh, what you're essentially trying to do is uh, bring your body back down to its pre-exercise metabolic rate. So what that means is you want to bring your heart rate down, bring your uh, breathing rate down, you want to make sure that you've removed uh, most of the carbon dioxide, most of the lactic acid. And so what you do is you, you uh, bring your body back to those metabolic rates slowly. And so you, your cool down is going to do the opposite of your warm up. It's going to decrease in intensity. It's going to become less specific uh, as it goes. It's going to help to move the blood away from that uh, the muscles that we used. So if you've been playing um, rugby union or something for hours and you've got lots of blood in your legs and stuff, um, if you stop exercising, then that blood is going to stay there and kind of pull and it's not going to be good for your recovery. Whereas if you do a cool down, it's going to help to remove that blood from your muscles because your muscles are no, now no longer demanding it and your body will start to send that blood elsewhere to where it is needed, back to your digestive system, for example, to get some nutrients to help it to recover. Uh, and so that cool down is going to essentially help to uh, redistribute your blood throughout your body and remove any kind of waste products. It'll help to decrease your muscle temperature back down to what it was, uh, and it'll also deliver some of those vital nutrients that are required for recovery. Priority preventative strategies. So this is your learn to. So what strategies are actually gonna be most in, uh, beneficial for my sport? Uh, again, specific to sport, and it's always going to revolve around those components of fitness. So do I need to be really flexible? Then flexibility is important. Um, if I need to be really strong and really powerful, then those kinds of um, health and skill-related components of fitness, they're the ones that are important for that athlete. So whenever you get asked, if you get asked a question in the exam, for example, about what strategies are going to be best for a particular athlete, first you need to think about the athlete, their sport, which components of fitness are really good for that sport. And then you need to say, okay, in order for them to be properly prepared for that, we need to think about, okay, our tennis player is going to need really high levels of power. They need to have really good skill, uh, which I know is not a component of fitness, but it's very important for that sport. Uh, it's specific to that sport. Uh, they're going to need a lot of muscular endurance. They're going to need plenty of agility uh, for that sport. And so they're the things you're going to, prioritize uh, for their performance so you're not going to uh, necessarily prioritize their flexibility not that it's not important for them but it's not as high as an important as uh, their agility is uh, you're always going to include warm-ups and cool downs uh, they are easily the most beneficial thing for avoiding injuries for players uh, and you also want to make sure that you're matching skill levels uh, with the appropriate um, competition. So someone who is autonomous should be playing in an autonomous competition and people who are beginners and are con cognitive skill um, executors, those kinds of players, they need to be playing against people who also have that. And they also should be getting some feedback from their coaches about you know, making sure that they actually are, are developing their skill appropriately and maintain, make sure they've got good technique. So how does adequate preparation actually reduce injury? So essentially, uh, your pre-screening is going to identify all those higher risk things and allow the person who is in charge of that sport or that exercise program to cater 
uh, what they do to reduce the risk. So if someone comes and they've just had uh, heart surgery, you don't then go and throw them into playing a flat out um, football game, or you don't have them doing sprints, you don't have them lifting really heavy weights over their head. Um, the exercise professional can then cater the exercise training and the performances and stuff to um, the person who has those risks. Uh, it also helps to make sure that the person is uh, fit or has appropriate level of fitness for their specific sport. So again, going through those components of fitness, making sure they're ready for their sport. Uh, you don't just want to take a gymnast and throw them into an AFL game. They're going to really struggle because they're not going to have the cardiorespiratory fitness to maintain that level of intensity for that long. Um, they may not even have the right technique or the right skills. So you really have to think through all of those things that are specific for sports to make sure that the person is properly prepared and that then reduces uh, their chances of injury. Uh, having correct technique, again, will reduce their chances of injury. Uh, matching skill levels will reduce chances of injury, including warm-up, adequate preparation times and stuff, is going to also make sure that the athlete has less chance of being injured because their muscle, their body is ready to go out and perform. Uh, and then say for the cool down, this is going to promote recovery. It's not about necessarily preventing injury in terms of like immediate acute injuries, but it is going to help to promote recovery and therefore it's going to avoid things like overuse injuries um, or repetitive strain injuries where the athlete is constantly doing the same thing. Uh, cool downs then become very important for that. Oh.